Greetings, gardeners. <clears throat> well, the trade winds have returned, uh, and we're getting intermittent showers coming through this afternoon. This is good because we were probably close to two weeks with hardly any rain here at all for a while. So glad to see the rain back. Although yesterday we got five inches in one day. That's a lot. What I'd like to do today is combine a few different things that I usually separate. So I'm going to give some garden report, a little bit of medical stuff, and a story all in one. They'll connect. Starting off, I've actually experimented on myself uh, with mamaki tea. It's good for uh, gastrointestinal problems, flatulence, uh, you know, things on that order. And I was having some uh, severe pain yesterday because of some lesions in my esophagus. They're probably there uh, from too much ibuprofen painkiller many years ago, and they just don't seem to want to heal. So every once in a while, they flare up, and they did, and it hurts. So I used some mamaki tea um, to see if it would help. It didn't hurt. So, I can attest to the fact if anybody else has any lesions that periodically hurt in their gut, I can't tell you whether the mamaki will cure them for you, but it won't hurt it, and it didn't taste bad. Moving on from herbal medicine into the garden, uh, for today's garden report, I'd like to call it, if the right one don't get them, the left one will. <laughs> oh, In the past... We've grown sweet potatoes here with no real pest problems other than that the pigs want to eat them all up and uh, tell me something else that I don't know. Um, or I can get white fly on the vines, although it doesn't really seem to decline them, so it's not a real severe problem as far as the crop is concerned. It's more of a problem with hosting the fly so it moves to something else later. But um, I have had no real severe pest problems on sweet potato. They've been easy, but no longer, at least not this year. Um, early on, I noticed that the leaves were being chewed by something. Well, I don't really get too worried about it this sort of thing. I mean, I'm the sort of guy, I'm organic in that regard. I don't like to spray uh, it, unless I absolutely have to. And I know that most plants will tolerate at least 20% defoliation with no harm to yield. So a lot of this stuff is cosmetic and it's in our heads when we see that bugs are chewing on crops. But this one was pretty much like the 2008 economic collapse in the U.S. I had never seen anything to that uh, proportion previously either, except listening to grandparents talk about the Great Depression. So I wasn't ready for that one, and I wasn't ready for this plague of beetles either. Um, it turned out that it just kept getting worse and worse and worse until it appeared that the crop was going to be damaged and my yield would be diminished because of the chewing. <clears throat> so I went after and I looked at things and what I found was a, a form of a greenish gold tortoise beetle and massive, massive infestation of them. I mean, I don't usually get infestations. This was an infestation and we've grown sweet potatoes here for years without this beetle. So. So go figure, I don't know what it's all about, but it happened, and when I investigated, I found that I also had an equal amount of larva on the vines, too. Well, since the crop was diminished due to the feeding, and isn't going to be that good this year, and we're close to digging season anyway, I decided that the best solution to my problem was to get out the 400,000 BTU propane weed flamer and go through the sweet potato patch. And that way I dormant the vines, remove most of the weeds, make it easier for me to see what was going on since the potatoes are underground anyway and the flamer wasn't going to hurt them. And the beetles were infesting the vines. And so when I went out after them with that flamer, 
Now, they tried to escape, but they could not, and I roasted every beetle that I ran across. And I, we're talking thousands. There were thousands uh, in there. And uh, so we cooked them all. But some of the vines, being a morning glory, uh, had spread through my Rosal and some of my other crops out there. So I couldn't use the flamer right near those crops. So then I switched from the right one to the left. <laughs> and with the left, I went after the rest of the vines with a spray of spinosad. That It's a bacteria that works on hard-bodied insects and leaf-chewing worms. Um, it was discovered in a tailings heap in a rum distillery in Barbados where they never seemed to get any kind of vermin in that tailings and so somebody bothered to stop and do an analysis and they found a bacteria that they call Bacillus spinosis uh, that works against uh, bugs. It's a good bacteria. You have to be careful how you use it because it can also take out a honeybee. So you don't use it while a plant is blooming. Um, but if you're out of bloom, um, and if you're going after things like ants or roaches or beetles or codling moth in apples and pears, you know, that's, that's a great thing. I like, I like spinosad. Um, anyhow, so we took the flamer after them, and then the rest of them that were left got a good drink of spinosad. I went through, and, um, and I'm hoping that's going to work as the vines now and the weeds dry down so I can see what's going on. I got, I'm going to dig the patch in a few more days. Um, hopefully that will work. Next year I'm probably going to have to start to use uh, periodic spinosad sprays on the crop if this beetle stays around. I have uh, sweet potatoes in other parts of the property that were not hit and so it was very localized. One new area out here that had been pasture and I put the potatoes in. Yeah, go figure, who knows. Uh, Anyway, so as I was going through in flaming, of course, uh, there's all sorts of critters out there. I ran across some sphinx moth larvae, the type that eats morning glory vines and so on. Um, but I also ran across a couple of my dreaded enemy, the cokey frog. Of course, we plumped them too, like a ballpark frank. Um, now I know I can hear the hackles raising on people out there who defend this amphibian. Um, um, you know, well, obviously you don't have a problem with the frog, so and maybe probably you don't live in Pune. It's probably why you you don't have a problem with the frog. Um, but I, I wanted to take the opportunity today just to talk about just to talk about Bill and amphibians because I seem to be getting a reputation for being a froggy killer out there on the web, and that really is not true. Uh, my history with amphibians has been one of love and consideration and care, um, not uh, violence and aggression. Um, this particular frog is a different story simply because it's a creature out of place. The frog does not belong here. It has absolutely no natural enemies in this environment. And so it breeds like rats. And, uh, you know, the county will say numbers up to uh, 2,000 per acre. I have seen other counts by people who claim that they know where they can find 50,000 of these babies per acre. Uh, but 2,000 is a quite reasonable figure to work with. Each frog produces um, 70 decibel. Well, 70 decibel is about the same thing as an old 1950s Hoover vacuum cleaner. If you need a sound comparison as far as how noisy that is, uh, well, if you got 2,000 of them per acre, it's like running 2,000 1950s Hoover vacuum cleaners simultaneously on one acre of land after dark while we're trying to sleep. And the, uh, the coke part of the call, the coke is not as bad as the key because the key is a high-pitched sound. A coke, if we could just get them to do coke, 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 probably wouldn't be near as bad. But with the key, go key, go key, go key, it's that key that's a very high frequency noise, and it goes actually right through house walls. To some extent, it passes through an insulated window, even through the glass, you know. And so my rule here on the farm is 50-foot rule. 
So, as you all probably realize by now, yes, I've been at war with one specific amphibian who has no natural enemies here uh, and is a real pain. But, you know, my history with amphibians has been, again, one of care, consideration, and, and I find that it's been tragic that on most of the planet today, uh, we have a fungus that's been attacking amphibians and killing off frogs and toads in huge numbers. Um, I had heard about it. I know it's in Central America, South America. Um, I had heard reports of uh, German toads, for instance, it literally exploding from this fungus. Um, and eventually, it, it, while I was living in the mainland in California, uh, the town of Fremont, where I lived around San Francisco Bay, at one time had a very large population of the green tree frog. It was a common noise in the evenings. Um, no, it's not nearly as obnoxious as the koki, but we would hear the tree frogs uh, in town, and like I said, they were quite common. Well, they began to disappear, and I didn't hear them anymore. And then eventually I was doing consultation for a client who had a very, very large koi pond who was finding toads all puffed up, dead and inflated uh, all over in her pond. They had come to the pond apparently to breed and mate, but they had picked up the fungus from the water in the pond and the toads were dying in mass. And she was wondering, you know, what's wrong with her pond? And I was trying to convince her that the problem was not going to injure the fish. The problem was with the, the amphibians. And, uh, you know, I, again, it was, to me, tragic. Uh, and I find it so strange. I mean, this is just plain weird, weirder than some of my ghost stories, is that all my life I've loved and protected amphibians in the mainland, but I find myself living in Hawaii now where we have this one particular amphibian that is literally a biblical plague of frogs, this thing, okay. How this can be, you know, I mean, that now I find myself in the one place on the planet where frogs are populating out of control with nothing to stop them, and I'm having to fight frogs back, yet all my life I protected frogs. It's, it's just so weird. Um, it really is. It, uh, m my history with this, so leading into the story I'd like to tell, uh, I had belonged to a musical ensemble for many, many years. This band started while we were in high school, and on and off the band continued under the same name well into the 1980s. Um, and you can find bits of The Dead Toad on uh, my website. There are little bits of music over there uh, that are still left from the toad. I still have others, but you know, there's a little bit out there. Uh, worked with those guys for years. and it, I mean, it's a very odd name, right? But, you know, rock and roll bands get all kinds of names. The way the name happened uh, was because we were rehearsing in the garage in summer in Illinois, and we took a break, and at that point we were trying to come up with a name for this band. Well, in the Midwest, you have some rather large Buffalo Americanus or American Toads, uh, that will hop over the highways in summer. Eh, trucks will hit the poor guys, you know, and flatten them out on the pavement, and then another car, and then another car, and then a gas truck, and pretty soon they are just laid out flat as a sheet of paper. Well, on the hot asphalt during August, these things will cook in the sun until they become mummies. They become leather, and they're preserved. Well, as kids, we used to call them um, sail toads. <laughs> Because we'd pick them up off the pavement and whip them at the girls, you know. They'd scream and run, ah, sail toad! Well, eventually, um, the frisbee was invented. And so at that point, we changed the name and we used to call them frisbee frogs. <laughs> well, that's just how it happened. We took a break from rehearsing and there was a frisbee frog out, of, out in front of the house. So we started playing frisbee frog with this thing and all of a sudden the drummer goes, Dude, let's call the band Dead Toad. Yeah, so that's how it got its name, was playing Frisbee Frog. I had this affinity with the toad and music. Okay, and I mean, I've, that connection is along. I have people who are artists who create toad things for me. 
because they know I happen to love toads. Rain's starting too. We got some trade showers today. Ellen should be down the hill in a minute. She was planting pineapples. Um, so moving onward in time, I had purchased a farm in Wisconsin at one point. We had a low spot in the pasture. And when a friend of mine was out of work uh, for a while and owned a, a dozer, I had him go in and dig me a two and a half acre fish pond. It was a good pond. We had a big hill that fed it. So it, it had a lot of sky pond runoff. Um, plus, bottom of the pond was on red adobe clay, but before we quit digging down at about 16 foot, we had a seam of red sand and the water just popped up through it. So we had ourselves a spring pond as well as a sky pond. The water stayed in it year round. And we I stocked it, you know, with fish and plants and so on, but the frogs began to move in naturally. And so first thing in spring, uh, April, sometimes even March when there was still snow, the spring peepers would come and they'd go to the pond to do the breeding. And while my house was quite a distance from this pond, but I would hear them at night singing. They were like little silver bells, really. Uh, I find the spring peeper as a tree frog to be an attractive noise. I enjoy it. And then after that, the next one to come along, you know, would be the uh, the trilling toads. And so the toads would be next, and they'd move in, and they'd begin breeding. They'd be followed by the leopard frogs, and then the pickerel frogs, and finally the bullfrogs. And as these different frog and, and, and toad species overlapped, you'd get first the peeper sound, but later the trilling toads would overlap with this. And then later when the peepers were gone and the trilling toads were ready to move on, the, the pickerel frogs would come in with their call. And these sounds would overlap and create this tapestry of amphibian noise, uh, finally terminating in the bullfrog with very low frequency bass tone. Um, well, one year, the bullfrogs came in up out of the meadow on the creek. They discovered my pond, and they bred and laid eggs all over that pond. And before I knew it, I had hundreds and maybe thousands of bullfrogs in my pond. Uh, well, being kind of an entrepreneurial spirit and a farmer, I looked at it, and I went, man, frog legs are worth a lot of money, and that's the species we lose for frog legs. And I started thinking, wow, I'm counting the income here. Well, about the time I maybe was going to cash in my chips, what happened is every bullfrog in the pond took off as an adolescent and went back where mom and dad were. They all just vacated. That was it. I had no more bullfrogs. I would have had to put up chicken wire fencing around the pond to stop the frogs in the froggy concentration camp, which I never did. Uh, and you know, I'm not big on eating frogs anyway. You know, it's, it's kind of a shame, personally. Uh, but the history with the frogs um, has really been one of, uh, of love, respect, care. Uh, I only have one amphibian enemy on this planet and it lives here. So with that little bit of background, I would like to tell a story about my relationship with frogs and toads. And it's a little mysterious, so it fits, I think, with our Halloween season. I call this story Flute for Toads. I recall waking from a dream once where I had been listening to the frog and toad chorus down by my pond. While still dreaming, I could hear the beautiful sound of their music. I was in awe. It had structure, pattern, and direction, like a piece of classical music. I could not imagine how I had missed this fact my entire life. I had never realized that frogs and toads were musicians. As I came closer to the surface of my dream, I could still hear the perfect beauty of the song. At the same time, I became conscious of the actual sounds out on the pond. Dream and reality met in seamless transition, and for a fleeting moment, I could hear both worlds of frog sound simultaneously. 
Then, like all great dreams, it faded into the mist of my subconscious, and all I heard was noise of amphibians instead of beautiful music. This wasn't the first time in my life that I was given a clue that toads actually understand music. The first experience was during a fine spring day when I took my girlfriend, a blanket, and my Selmer flute into Deer Grove Forest Preserve of Northern Illinois for a bit of jamming and bonding. We struck off the usual trails and just headed into the woods looking for a secluded spot. Eventually I located a clearing where we spread the blanket and sat down. I felt like blowing the flute. So I put it together and began blowing a spring song off the top of my head. It was a good groove. And I worked for a while, blowing spring flowers, new leaves through the soft, moist air of the flute. After a spell, I looked across the clearing and I saw two very large toads hop out of the brush. They were a bit odd because one of them was almost charcoal color while the other was a light tan. I was pretty sure they were the same species, Buffalo Americanus. They had very different colored skins. I continued blowing but kept my eye on them. Slowly but surely the two toads hopped across the clearing and came right up in front of me. They seemed to be enjoying the flute playing, and they were watching me. Soon the toads began to drill. This is the sound a toad makes. They don't croak or peep like frogs. They have a long and high noise. These two appeared to be jamming with me. It seems strange to us when animals pay attention or play with us. If you think about all the interaction we've had with our pets, it really isn't so strange. We're just not used to wild animals joining the party. Well, these toads really did crash our party. For the next hour, they were the only creatures that got any attention. I stopped playing at a point and I reached down and I began to pet the tan one behind the head. He kind of stretched a little bit, moved closer, and decided I enjoyed being stroked. I tried the dark one and found that he too enjoyed the handling. I lost track of how long we were there, but I stroked, talked, and jammed with those toads for several hours. I'm positive that toads enjoy and understand music. Now these might have been some sort of enchanted toad or something, but it doesn't change the main point. Toads love music. Long live toads. Okay, there you go. Not exactly a ghost story, but a little odd, you know. Has anybody else ever had the experience of having amphibians actually come to them? Uh, so for all the folks that think I absolutely hate frogs, this is not true. I have a long history of, of, of adoring these creatures. I enjoy them. I just don't like the cokey frog. <laughs> Aloha, Anglus, Happy Garden.